Hello, today we're going to yet again continue our discussion on contracts with Chapter 16, the form and meaning of contracts. The general rule with all contracts is this. Oral contracts or spoken contracts are generally every bit as binding as written contracts. However, under the statute of frauds, certain contracts must be evidenced by a writing to be enforceable. Which means this, you can have an oral contract for anything, anything. However, if the subject matter falls under the, sub the statute of frauds, if you want to enforce it, it better be in writing, otherwise the courts will not enforce it. So thus, contracts that fall under the statute of frauds are not voidable, they're not void, they are unenforceable. The bottom line is this, always get your contracts in writing. Therefore, you never have to worry about violating the statutes of frauds. What contracts have to be in writing under the statute of frauds? There are four of them. First, con excuse me, first, contracts transferring <coughs> an interest in land. Land is more important than other forms of property, types of personal property, because land is unique. You could buy a bracelet, but there are millions of bracelets, but there's only one piece of land. Every piece of land has un is unique. So any contract transferring an interest in land must be in writing if you want to enforce it. An interest can include selling real estate or such things as mining the land be below it, providing an easement to cross somebody else's land or a lease of the land. There is one big exception to this, and that's called the partial performance doctrine. So a contract will not have to be in writing to be enforceable if it falls under the partial performance exception. Here, the buyer of the land must have made either substantial improvements to the property, or the buyer has taken possession of the land and paid most, if not all, of the purchase price. Then a contract does not have to be in writing to be enforceable. The second contract that must be in writing under the statute of frauds is an executor's agreement to personally pay their descendants' debts. Sounds confusing, right? Let me give you the explanation. <clears throat> when a decedent, that's a dead person, does not have enough funds to pay for his or her to pay his or her creditors, if the executor of the estate decides to personally cover such debts, that deal between the executor and the decedent's creditors must be in writing to be enforceable. So let's say, like for instance, my dad died recently. Let's say he owed creditors money when he died. If I step, that, that does not have to be in writing to be enforceable. But if I step in as the executor of my late father's estate and tell the creditors, if there's no money in my dad's account, I will step up and pay for it. That agreement between myself, the executor, and my late father's creditors need to be in writing to be enforceable. So if I make an oral contract to my late father's creditors and I don't pay, they can't enforce it against me because it was not in writing. The third contract that must be in writing under the statute of frauds is contracts to answer for the debt of another. What that means is, for instance, Let's say I go with my son, who's an adult, to go out and purchase a audio system. And they look at my son's credit, my adult son's credit, and says, eh, credit's a little spotty. And I come in and say, hey, if my son can't pay for it, I will. So the agreement between me, the, the parent, and 
person selling the sound system, that writing has to be in that had that agreement has to be in writing to be enforceable. So again, contracts to answer for the debt of another have to be in writing to be enforceable. The final contract that must be in writing to be enforceable under the statute of frauds is what's called for the bilateral contract or what I call the one year provision, which states that any contract that's not to be performed in a year or not capable of being performed in a year has to be in writing to be enforceable. Thus, if it's even possible that the contract could be performed in one year, it does not have to be in writing to be enforceable. So for instance, if you've ever gone across the Golden Gate Bridge, it's a massive bridge. So let's say I had the contract to build the Golden Gate Bridge after an earthquake brought it down to rebuild it. Usually there's no way me and my team could build that Golden Gate Bridge within a year. But if it's possible, if I hired a billion workers, it's possible that bridge could be done in less than a year and it doesn't have to be in writing to be enforceable. So let's give a little few examples and exceptions to this. <clears throat> if one side has completely performed a bilateral contract, the other party must do so. So for instance, if uh, F lends C $500 orally, which is in, in, spoken, to be paid back in 18 months, it's still enforceable because one party fully performed, in this case, F fully performed by lending the money, F is done. So even though it doesn't have to be paid back in over a year, it doesn't have to be in writing because one party fully performed. In addition, the one year period starts when the con contract comes into existence, not when the time for performance is to begin. So for instance, let's say on January 1 to bring in the new year, I contract with Mary to say, starting in May, I want you to work for nine months for me from May, nine months out. Well, nine months is less than a year, so it should not have to be in writing, but we look at the one year period from when the contract came into existence. The contract did not come into existence here in May when performance is to begin, but when the contract came into existence in January 1. January to May is five months, and nine months after that makes it longer than 12 months. That contract has to be in writing to be enforceable because the time period is over a year, even though the performance was only for nine months. Finally, be wary of tricky language. So for instance, contracts, quote unquote, for life, do not have to be in writing to be enforceable under the statute of frauds because anyone could die at any time. However, a contract, quote, for five years must be in writing because there's no way that anything less than five, five years is less than one year. Additional contracts that must be in writing to be enforceable, but not under the statute of frauds, but rather the Universal Commercial Code. Under the UCC requires contracts, as you know, the UCC for the sale of goods requires contracts for the sale of goods that total $500 or more must be in writing. So if it's $499.99, it does not have to be in writing. But if it's $500, it has to be in writing to be enforceable. Okay. There are obviously exceptions to this. The first exception is for specially manufactured goods. So if goods are specially made for the buyer and made a substantial beginning to manufacturing, then even though you didn't have it in writing, it can still be enforceable. So if I contract with an artist to build a life-size um, statue of me for $40,000, well, that's $500 and more, but we did it orally. We did, did, it wasn't in writing. And then they, the artist makes the statute of David. And in this case, um, I decide I'm not going to pay it. And, it, you know, I claim, you know, it's $500 or more, and it had to be in writing to be enforceable. 
well, this one will meet the exception of specially manufactured goods because no one wants a statute of David. The second exception to the UCC $500 or more writing requirement is either what's called delivery and acceptance of part of the goods or payment and acceptance of part of the goods. If either of those has happened, then an exception applies. The final exception to the UCC $500 or more requirement is what's called an admission in a court proceeding. So either during testimony, during an actual court, or during a deposition, or anything in the court proceeding, um, then whatever you admit to, it's enforceable. Other things on the slide that have to be in writing to be written but don't necessarily fall under the statute of frauds is bankruptcy discharge or statute of limitations must be writing. So any state requiring contracts reaffirming debts that were either barred by bankruptcy or the statute of limitations must be in writing to be enforceable. So for instance, if you file for bankruptcy <clears throat> and you're protected from your creditors, if you make another payment to a creditor after you file for bankruptcy, that payment must be in a writing if it wants to be enforced. An oral one will not be enforced. Contracts for real estate commissions, not just the land, but the commission behind it must be in writing to be enforceable. And the favorite one here, the one that always gets a few chuckles, is con contracts not for marriage, but rather in contemplation of marriage. So, for instance, back in the day, a father who wanted to see his daughter married off oftentimes would provide a dowry or some sort of, you know, consideration to the guy who was going to marry his daughter. So, for instance, if I told Stacy's dad, Mr. Scanlon, that, hey, I want to marry your daughter, and he says, this is great, so because you're going to marry my daughter off, you need, I want to give you some chicken, some ducks, some hen, etc., some sheep. That is in contemplation of marriage. That agreement between me and Stacy's dad has to be in writing to be enforceable. So as I stated at the beginning of today's chapter, <clears throat> oral contracts that come with provisions of the statute of frauds or the UCC or some of the other ones I just brought up, they're not void or unavoidable, they are unenforceable. The courts just won't hear it. A couple things that you should know though, if all, if both parties or all the parties have performed their obligations, neither can rescind the oral contract under the statute of frauds because if they both performed, in essence, it's an executed contract. It really is no more contract. There are some two big exceptions here to failure to comply under the statute of frauds or one of the other things I brought up. The first thing is what's called partial performance. A person who partially performs under an oral contract can recover the reasonable value of performance in quasi-contract. So for instance, let's say I hire someone to work for me for three years, but I don't put it in writing, it's oral. And they work for me for two months and then I haven't paid them yet and I fire them. And they sue me saying, hey, we had a three-year contract. And I say, hey, it wasn't in writing. The one-year provision states it has to be in writing to be enforceable. And while I'm right, I, that's correct, I still need to pay them for their two months' work under the partial performance except, uh, exception. And our old friend that keeps come biting you, in the, biting you is promissory estoppel or detrimental reliance. So under this doctrine, it's been used to allow parties to recover under oral contracts, which the statute of frauds would find unenforceable. Remember, what is promissory estoppel? Is when someone makes a promise, the promisor makes a promise, likely to induce reliance by the promisee. And in fact, the promisee does live up to the promise, relies on that promise and relies on the promise he relies on that promise, which is not a contract to his or her detriment. The courts will allow the promisee to recover the value under this doctrine. So what kind of writing is required if it has to be in writing to be enforceable? Really, it doesn't necessarily need anything. It just needs to be a memorandum. <clears throat> 
And in the memorandum, all you have to do is one, identify the parties, two, identify the subject matter, and number three, it must be signed by the party to be bound or their agent. Any writing will suffice, and even an X mark marks the spot for a signature is enough. I'm going to skip slides seven and eight and move on to a new part of today's lecture, how we interpret contracts that are in writing. So when we reduce a contract to a writing to meet the statute of frauds requirement, the parties to the contract may often disagree about the terms of the contract. Certain terms may be, you know, ambiguous or uncertain, such as, I want you to buy the car over there. Well, where does there mean? Is there north? Is there south? You know, etc. So <clears throat> we use what's known as the plain reading standard. And this plain reading st standard is objective. We use TARP, the average reasonable person. What would a re the average reasonable person believe of the terms of the contract in, given its context? So based on this average reasonable person standard, let's look at some rules of construction. <coughs> Ordinary words are given their usual and customary meaning. That seems, that seems understandable. However, technical words are given their technical meaning unless a different meaning was clearly intended. Okay. In addition, when parties are members of a trade or community, common usage within that community determines the meaning of a word. So, for instance, you know, a dozen to most everybody means 12, but in the baking community, a baker's dozen traditionally means not 12, but rather 13. Other things to keep in mind, written terms will be given more weight over printed terms that the two conflict. So what that means is if we type something up, we printed it up, and then we wrote written terms there, what we put in handwriting will control the printed terms because the idea is that the written terms were written after what was printed out there and really reflect more of the meaning of the minds. Finally, when terms are ambiguous, they're usually always resolved against the person who drafted the contract. Because the idea is the person who drafted the contract purposely put in a word that's ambiguous and thus should not be rewarded for that. Okay, the final two slides deal with what's called the parole evidence rule. And this is very confusing, so I want to make sure you listen and read it in the textbook, and then re-listen. Here's the parole evidence rule. When the parties to an agreement have expressed their agreement in a complete and unambiguous writing, that writing is the best evidence of their intent, period. Thus, under the parole evidence rule, a party cannot vary the terms of a written contract by introducing evidence of terms allegedly agreed on either prior to, before, or contemporaneous at the same time. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Bob buys a house from Susan. B, Bob, the buyer, buys a house from Susan, the seller. They orally agree, not in writing, but spoken, they orally agree that Susan will pay for any major repairs needed for the house in the first year after the purchase. However, the written sales agreement between Bob the buyer and Susan the seller does not include this oral term. Well, what do you think happens? The furnace breaks after the first six months and Susan refuses to pay for what they orally agreed to. Thus, under the parole evidence rule, Bob cannot introduce the oral evidence. What is the lesson here? Well, it seems rather obvious, but parties who put their agreements in writing should make sure that all of the terms of their 
agreement are included in the writing. Again, anyone who puts their agreement in writing should make sure that all the important terms of their agreement are included in the writing. Because the idea is, if you put it in writing, you should have put everything that you wanted in the contract. The four corners of the contract. However, there are exceptions to the parole evidence rule. We want to look at five of them. What it means if there's an exception to the parole evidence rule means, listen, there are situations here where the writing is either not the best evidence of the agreement, and thus we should bring in other evidence, or two, the party's not challenging that the writing is the best evidence, but simply is challenging the contractual obligations that that writing represents. So the first one here is lack of voluntary consent. And we've talked about consent in a previous chapter. <clears throat> so thus you can bring in oral proof that the writing was entered into as a result of such things as fraud, non-fraudulent misrepresentation, duress, undue influence, or mistake. Why? Because there's a strong public policy against enforcing such agreements. What we're saying, the person who's saying here is not trying to contradict the terms of the writing, but saying the writing was entered into under dubious circumstances. So for example, uh, let's say one, let's say a student puts a gun to my head and says, you will sign, you will sign this contract selling the mansion for $5,000 to me. I want to bring in, as an exception to the parole evidence rule, oral proof that the contract was entered into under duress, that someone put a gun to my head. I'm not saying that I didn't sign the contract. I'm saying that the contract was entered into under duress, and I want to bring in evidence for that. The second exception to the parole evidence rule would be to explain an ambiguity. So oral testimony or non-written testimony can be introduced to the court in interpreting the writing if the terms of the writing are unclear. Okay, third exception to the parole evidence rule, it fills in a writing that's incomplete. In essence, we can introduce proof of oral terms that in essence fill in the gaps of the writing. So let's say for instance, if I had a rental agreement with a prospective tenant to buy a house, to rent one of the houses that I own, but in the agreement, I leave that you're going to rent this house at, and I have it, I have it a underlying area to fill it in, I didn't fill in which of my five rentals you're gonna have, we can bring in evidence that shows that the writing was incomplete and that you were gonna rent the house on 20th Street as opposed to the house on 10th Street. The fourth exception to the parole evidence rule is subsequent oral content, contracts, not prior to or before or contemporaneous at the same time, but subsequent oral contracts. You can introduce proof of an oral agreement made after the writing was created because when you created the writing, you couldn't have anticipated something after the fact. Finally, the fifth exception to the parole evidence rule that allows you to bring in evidence here is known as a condition precedent. We haven't really talked about condition precedents yet. Here, under a condition, condition prece, precedent, oral testimony can be introduced to prove any conditions that must occur before it becomes effective. Such proof elaborates on but does not contradict the terms of what was in the writing itself. So for instance, let's say I was going to sell my house to a student for a million dollars, but when we had the meeting in the minds, it was, there was gonna be a condition precedent provided they get an A in my class. Well, in the actual writing, we just said that here, Mr. Adams is gonna sell the mansion to the student for a million dollars. We didn't put the condition precedent in the writing of the contract, provided you get an A in the class. I can introduce evidence of the condition precedent, provided that the student gets an A in the class. 
that proof elaborates on but does not contradict the terms of the writing sell in the house for a million dollars. So those are the five exceptions to the parole evidence rule that it does allow you to enter into evidence something even though we have a complete and unambiguous writing. This concludes today's lecture on Chapter 16, The Form and Meaning of Contracts.